Great, thanks. Welcome everyone. Really happy to have you on this session today, uh, where we'll be looking at caregiver and family strengthening approaches to preventing harm for children. We've got three really interesting and really well thought out um, approaches for working at the family level for prevention. So I think it's gonna be really nice discussion and learning um, among all of us. So I'm really looking forward to this session and I hope it will be uh, interesting for you as well. Now, if we can just start with some housekeeping, we can go to the next slide. Oh, sorry about that. There's a few more pictures to pop up. And um, so the first thing is that we are going to have some group discussions in this session. So it would be great if you could, as for maybe previous sessions you've been on, just uh, rename yourself with the language you would prefer for the group discussions. So you can put the, the EN for English before your name, AR for Arabic, FR for French, and uh, SP for Spanish. You can see the instructions in the chat as well. And then if there's enough people um, in your language group, then that um, you can use that language in your discussion groups. Um, beyond that, um, it's just really to ask for your active participation. I know the presenters are really interested in your questions and your comments and your ideas as well um, and engaging together. So yeah, anything that can make this more like a face-to-face -face meeting, um, it's great if you can keep your videos on, um, turn off your phones, all of the things we do in our uh, regular face-to-face -face meetings, even if we haven't been in them for a while. Um, so hopefully we'll have some good discussions. I also just wanted to note that we will have part of the presentations will be in French, and then we'll be having um, English subtitles during those sections so we can all follow along, but also feel free to, to write your questions or comments in French if you prefer, um, as well as English. All right, so um, I think we'll do move to the introduction of our presenters for today. Okay, so we've got three exciting present presentations. The first is from the International Rescue Committee. And this is on preventing child recruitment through parenting, a socio-cognitive approach. And we have Alexander Blackwell, Fabienne Zumbasa di Soko, and Ange Machaguero. And then for our second presentation, it will be looking at structured household coaching, con um, how it contributes to the prevention of harm to children in humanitarian settings from AVSI's graduating to resilience coaching model. And we have Catherine Nafula and Innocent Sunier from AFC Uganda today. And then last but not at all least, we have um, from Tushindi Children's Trust in Kenya, we have holistic and targeted family strengthening interventions to prevent child abuse. And that will be presented by Maureen Karanja. So those are our exciting presentations for today. Um, before we get to the presentations, we're just going to uh, do a bit of a warm up to get to know each other, maybe practice our clicking on the link in the chat muscle. Um, so we're going to put a quick Mentimeter link in the chat, just to ask where are you, uh, what country are you joining us from today? So you can see the Mentimeter link in the chat and you can go ahead and just tell us what country you're, you're joining us from today. And I see in the chat, you can also put it in the chat. Helen is joining us from Djibouti. For our presenters, I know I'm from in Jordan. We've got France, UK, Malaysia, Lebanon. And I know our presenters are in Kenya and Uganda, Democratic Republic of Congo. I see Nepal in the chat, Austria, Singapore, Bethlehem in Palestine. Okay, we've got a good mix of regions. So for some of us, it's the morning, some of us the afternoon. In Japan, maybe it's even getting into the evening. Not sure, okay. All right, great. Well, welcome everyone. 
from wherever you're joining us. And it's nice to have this range of experience as well when we're looking at the different approaches to see how it can work in all these different countries. Also got Cameroon, another colleague from DRC. Fantastic. Okay. Um, okay, so if we, uh, we have a second question for you as well. And this one is more about why did you decide to join this session um, on family and caregiver, family level, family strengthening and working with caregivers for prevention. So the second question, and again, it's in the Menti link, so you can go back to your Menti link. Um, what are some challenges or questions you have about working with caregivers and uh, families to prevent harm to children? So you can go ahead and just enter your questions here. And then it would be great. We can keep the, these in mind as we go through the session. Um, and hopefully for some of your questions, we'll be able to, to address those and really get into some discussions on those issues. So I'll give you a minute just to go ahead and write any questions you have. Okay, we've got a first one on cultural differences. That's a very good question. How can we adapt things for different contexts? What works with caregivers? So challenges of parenting programs in humanitarian settings. Yeah, what are some adaptive strategies? to see programs that can measure positive outcomes. And that would be interesting to look at measurement. I wonder, maybe I can just ask Alexandra and Maureen um, and Catherine, do you see any questions that you think you'll be addressing in your presentation? You can just unmute and say. Um, it's all moving very quickly, but um, I can say, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about contextualization in, in two different contexts in our presentation. Um, so that translation across across cultures and contexts, um, and and different approaches for different uh, contexts. Great, thanks, Alexandra. Um, Susan, I see a few mm -hmm. questions on sustainability and how to measure this family strengthening efforts. So, yes, I do think we will cover some of that in our presentation. Super, Maureen, thank you. Yeah, there are a lot of good questions here. What to do about dangerous caregivers, different families, different approaches, how do we adapt it? and looking at intergenerational family. All right, great. All right, let's keep these questions in mind. I, I think a lot of them hopefully we'll get into. Um, and if we haven't gotten to, to them, we'll have a Q&A session um, at the end of this, um, as well as the, the group discussion time. So we'll have a lot of time to, to make sure those questions are, are examined. All right, so we're going to move on to our first presentation. Um, so I'd like to welcome our presenters from the IRC. Uh, we have Alexandra Blackwell, who's a researcher and who oversees the IRC's research portfolio on violence prevention and response. Um, welcome, Alexandra. We also have Ange Mashagiro. She is a child protection officer from IRC in the Democratic Republic of Congo, joining us from Goma today in North Kivu. So welcome, Ange. Um, and I'm just gonna ask, do we have Fabienne? Okay, Fabienne, great to have you with us. So Fabienne Zumbasa di Soko is a senior uh, officer for child protection with the IRC in Central African Republic. So welcome, Fabian. great to have you all here. And I'll hand it over to Alexandra to start us off. Great, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm Alexandra, I'm with the IRC, and today we're speaking to you 
about a project on a family-based intervention to prevent recruitment and support the reintegration of children. Um, and so it looks like we're not on the front first page of the uh, presentation. Thanks so much. Um, so you can go ahead to the second slide. Um, this project started out with formative research, which sought to gain a greater understanding on the drivers of recruitment of adolescents into armed groups in conflict settings. So we looked at the drivers of recruitment as well as the barriers and facilitators uh, for reintegration. And we interviewed adolescents who are previously involved in armed groups or who are at risk of joining, as well as caregivers of adolescents in armed groups. So we conducted in-depth interviews with both of these groups in the Central African Republic and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide. So this framework shows the drivers of recruitment for them, the perspective of both adolescents and their caregivers, including the influence of individual experiences, the actions of others, um, and environmental factors on the individual child's decision to join the, join the armed groups. So this was what uh, the two different perspectives that came out of our formative research. We identified some economic and social push and pull factors that are common in the literature across contexts. Um, but we also specifically focused in Deepest apologies, Alexandra. I uh, muted you while trying to mute someone else. My apologies. Okay, I'm not sure where I- About not even five seconds. <laughs> okay. Um, so for this, we, we looked at different economic and social push and pull factors that were common in the literature across contexts, but we really also focused in on the influence of social networks within the home, um, particularly family and caregiver child dynamics um, and we found that these relationships play a really important role in child decision making. So, for example, um, looking at parental approval or condoning of engagement with armed groups, we saw that um, among those children who were at risk of joining but who had not engaged with armed groups, none had caregivers condone the armed groups, and some even explicitly had caregivers or other family members directly advise them not to engage. We did see some gender differences, so that was true specifically for boys, um, whereas girls more often joined or engaged with armed groups with parental support, or they engaged um, relating to particularly negative or harmful relationships that they had with their caregivers. We also saw the important role of caregivers throughout the child's experience with armed groups. Um, many stayed in contact with their caregivers throughout their experience. Um, they described valuing their opinion and disliking the tension caused by their decision, and they described the caregiver as a reason that they decided to leave the armed group in the end. Um, so this really highlighted for us the importance of a supportive home environment also upon return when they did make that decision. You can go ahead to the next slide. So based on these formative research results, we developed with the consulting firm Articolo 12, um, the intervention for parents um, of children in conflict settings. It's called Growing Stronger Together, and it's focusing specifically on conflict settings where there's recruitment into armed forces and armed groups. The ultimate goal is to support caregivers to better support their children to prevent recruitment and facilitate their reintegration. So we have an intervention package uh, that we've piloted and did a feasibility evaluation in the Central African Republic and the Democratic Republic of Congo. We're also doing additional pilots in Nigeria and Iraq. Um, so now I'll hand over to my colleagues, Fabienne, who's a Child Protection Senior Officer in CAR, and Anj, who's our Child Protection Officer in DRC, to talk a bit more about the adaptation to those settings. So over to you, Fabienne. Bonjour à tous. Bonjour, Alexandra. Alors, euh, merci pour la présentation de recherche. Nous allons très brièvement présenter euh, euh, les résultats de la mise en œuvre à, en RCA.
Alors, euh, l'adaptation en RCA. En, en RCA, on avait eu à travailler sur deux sites, à savoir à Kagabandoro et à Bokaranga. Pour ces deux sites, on a 50 enfants et 50, adoles, euh, 50 adolescents et 50 parents par site. Donc, 100 bénéficiaires à Kagabandoro et 100 bénéficiaires à, à Bokaranga. Et nous avions eu à travailler avec euh, les parents sur euh, la méthodologie de compétences parentales positives SPARC et nous avons eu également à travailler avec les enfants sur la méthodologie CEF euh, qui est en anglais un euh, appui aux adolescents avec leur famille en situation d'urgence. Cette méthodologie euh, qui tient compte des besoins réels de, des adolescents pendant les conflits armés et les situations d'urgence et se renforce aussi la résilience de ces adolescents. C'est sur ces, cette méthodologie que nous avions travaillé avec les, les adolescents. Également, euh, nous avons travaillé sur le contenu de modules où il y avait des différents, pour les parents, où il y avait des différents scénarios qui répondent également euh, à la vie sociale des parents pendant les situations d'urgence. C'était... Euh, euh, très marquant pour tous les parents et ils ont accepté, ils ont euh, validé même le contenu de, euh, de méthodologie. En ce qui concerne le, les défis, nous avions eu au départ des défis liés à la situation sécuritaire pour les deux sites, y compris Kagabandoro et euh, Bukaranga. On n'avait pas eu d'accès au départ par rapport à la présence des de multiples groupes armés. Et au fil du temps, on avait eu à, 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 à parvenir et à mettre en œuvre cette méthodologie, mais un peu en retard, raison pour laquelle on avait demandé un prolongement du projet jusqu'au 30 octobre. Et en plus de, de l'insécurité, on avait aussi euh, d'autres défis liés euh, aux difficultés logistiques. Allô? Oui. OK. Euh, on avait eu tra à travailler avec des, ces, ces parents où ils ont partagé euh, leurs expériences, ils ont parlé de ce qui est arrivé à leurs enfants et par rapport aux modules, ils se sont dit d'accord pour, pour pouvoir euh, accompagner leurs enfants dans, la, dans leur réintégration dans la communauté. Et ils, de leur côté, ils nous, ils ont, ils nous ont fait euh, des recommandations. Et parmi ces recommandations, euh, ils nous ont dit de travailler beaucoup plus avec nos mécanismes communautaires qui sont comme nos euh, euh, piliers dans la communauté, de, de sensibiliser beaucoup plus la communauté sur la réintégration des, des enfants anciennement impliqués. Car dans la communauté, les enfants anciennement impliqués dans les, les forces, dans les groupes armés, ils n'ont pas de, de, de place de leur retour parce qu'on les considère comme des monstres, des assassins, des tueurs, des personnes qui ont fait du mal à la communauté. Alors que ces enfants-là euh, n'ont pas... Euh, euh, que ces enfants-là, normalement, ne doivent pas être considérés de la sorte. Alors, ils nous ont pris de beaucoup travailler avec les mécanismes de sensibiliser sur ces questions afin que ces enfants-là puissent retourner dans la communauté et puissent avoir leur place en tant qu'enfants dans la communauté. En plus de ça, ils ont fait encore d'autres recommandations, euh, celui de continuer, euh, celle de continuer la facilitation pour d'autres parents. Parce que pour les parents, ils pensent que le quota de 50 parents dans une grande ville comme... Euh, par exemple, la ville de Kagabando, quand on a eu à, à faire la mise en œuvre, c'est insignifiant parce que beaucoup, beaucoup des enfants ont été impliqués dans les, les groupes armés et beaucoup, beaucoup de leurs parents subissent les maltraitances, euh, les préjudices euh, à la place de ces enfants. Et la question de réintégration de ces enfants aussi pose des énormes, des, des énormes problèmes. Donc, ils sollicitent à ce que dans l'avenir, on puisse aussi euh, continuer les facilitations avec d'autres parents qui sont dans le besoin. Et à la fin, ils ont fait aussi euh, une recommandation comme quoi euh, les effets des, 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 
des crises, les effets des conflits armés ont fait que beaucoup, beaucoup de parents ont perdu leurs biens. Et ils ont sollicité à, à ce que, après ces facilitations, on puisse soutenir certains parents avec des moyens pour les, les mises en œuvre des AGR ou euh, pour le travail champêtre, pour qu'ils puissent bien s'occuper de leurs enfants et de faciliter leur intégration dans la communauté. Donc, c'est les, les, les recommandations que ces parents ont, ont pu faire euh, pendant la, la facilitation. Alors, euh, les bienfaits, si je, nous pouvons parler des bienfaits de, 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 cette, méthode, de cette mise en œuvre, en général, nous pouvons dire qu'à 90%, les parents et les enfants ont, ont beaucoup plus admiré euh, cette mise en œuvre, malgré qu'ils ne sont pas nombreux, mais ils ont proposé aussi... Euh, que dans l'avenir, ils, ils sensibiliseront à, à leur tour aussi leur père. C'est-à-dire les parents vont aussi sensibiliser d'autres parents pour euh, euh, contribuer à la réintégration de leurs enfants dans la communauté et voir même la communauté elle-même d'accepter ces enfants-là, de renforcer la résilience de ces enfants après euh, leur retour dans la communauté. Je pense que c'est un peu euh, en général euh, la mise en œuvre et l'adaptation de la S, et je ne sais pas s'il y a d'autres questions pour des clartés plus amples. Merci. Thank you, Fabienne. And I think we're, we'll do the question and answer at the end. Il y aura les questions à la fin. On va passer maintenant à Ange. So over to you, Ange. Uh, pardon, Ange, on ne peut pas t'entendre. Il faut juste uh, uh, unmute. OK. J'ai dit que je vais parler à propos de la mise en œuvre de la RDC par rapport à l'adaptation. Nous, ce qu'on avait fait au départ, on avait fait la, la réunion communautaire au début du projet sur le curriculum parental. On a fait la mobilisation communautaire où il y avait présence de différentes sources sociales, les leaders locaux, les représentants de sociétés civiles, les représentants des groupes marginalisés. Par rapport à l'implémentation, l'implémentation a été faite dans trois zones de santé, notamment la zone de santé de Kiroche, précisément à Chacha, la zone de santé de Niragongo, précisément à Kibumba, la zone de santé de Beni, précisément à Wangoma. Par rapport au succès, les communautés actives de base de ces trois zones précitées ont été très reconnaissantes et ont jeté des pierres à IRC des fleurs à travers son programme de Child Protection parce que c'est un programme, c'est une approche qui est venue songer aux adolescents, notamment aux personnes vivant avec handicap qui est oublié dans, tous les projets, dans presque tous les projets. Il y a aussi le programme SPARC qui est venu renforcer les compétences parentales, qui a joué un rôle très capital dans ces trois zones. 100%, on a observé que 100% des participants CEF étaient des enfants associés dans des forces et des grou et groupes armés. Par rapport aux répartitions des groupes, on avait dix groupes des adolescents ont été dotés de compétences de vie courante sur CEF, soutien aux adolescents et leurs familles en situation d'urgence dans ces trois zones. On avait aussi dix groupes de parents, de dix ont été dotés de compétences parentales dans les zones de santé de Kiroche, Beni et Niragongo. Ça, on avait fait cette répartition, c'était à cause des problèmes de COVID-19 où on devait respecter les mesures barrières. Par rapport aux difficultés, il y avait la résistance de certains parents à Kibumba suite aux comparaisons des différents projets où les enfants étaient réintégrés économiquement et socialement. Quand on parlait de ça, auparavant, on avait un projet de l'UNICEF où on tenait compte des besoins spécifiques des enfants. Il y avait la réintégration professionnelle et à la fin, on donnait les âgères à ces, ces parents de ces enfants associés dans des forces et groupes armés. 
Il y avait la perturbation de notre calendrier du travail suite aux catastrophes naturelles volcaniques du 22 mai 2020. Donc, c'est-à-dire qu'on avait acquis un retard presque d'un mois. C'est pourquoi on avait sollicité l'extension d'un mois pour voir comment on peut récupérer la, la, la situation. Par rapport aux difficultés, les participants masculins étaient moins nombreux par rapport aux participantes féminines. Et ceci est dit dans, en RDC, ceci s'explique par les faits de gender. Donc, on suppose que les hommes doivent aller chercher à manger pour leurs enfants. C'est pourquoi dans nos groupes de discussion, il y avait tant de femmes que de hommes. La sélection, notre sélection n'a pas été facile vu que nous étions face de beaucoup de vulnérables qui répondaient aux critères mais on devait tenir compte des nombres choisis par les projets. C'est-à-dire, lorsqu'on avait fait la mobilisation communautaire, on avait présenté nos critères, notre zone d'intervention. Maintenant, il y avait beaucoup de gens qui sont venus et ils étaient dans des critères. Mais nous, on, on devait tenir compte des nombres qui sont choisis par les projets. C'est une chose qui n'a pas été facile pour nous. Par rapport à Beni, il y avait les, les, les attaques multiples à Beni qui ont causé un retard aussi, mais on a eu à récupérer la situation à cause de ces mois qu'on nous a ajoutés. Comme le saut a pris, vu le contenu du curriculum parenting, les parents membres de la communauté qui ont compris l'importance des sessions demande la continuité du projet. On a vu l'importance de ce curriculum parce que ça a renforcé la cohésion et ce sont des choses réelles que la population d'ici vit. Donc, on demande à ce qu'on on pérennise les activités même dans d'autres zones. Les sessions ont permis aux parents d'avoir une idée sur l'évolution de leurs enfants tout en comprenant leurs différents stades de croissance les genres et son implication dans leur rôle au sein du foyer et avoir une connaissance sur quelques réseaux qui poussent un enfant à rejoindre les groupes armés. Donc, on a vu que c'est une approche qui est très capitale parce que ça a permis aux parents de connaître les différents stades des enfants, de savoir distinguer les genres au sexe pour que qu'il n'y ait pas encore une discrimination. Et les parents aussi ont aussi les réseaux qui poussent les enfants à rejoindre les groupes armés et comment ils peuvent soutenir ces enfants du retour. Certains parents ne savent plus répondre au minimum des besoins de leurs enfants suite à l'accès limité au chat. Quand on parle à l'accès limité au chat, ça s'est dit ça se dit à cause de l'insécurité. Maintenant, on a dit que le curriculum est important. Si on associe à ce curriculum à d'autres activités, par exemple les âgés des, des parents, les activités de réintégration professionnelle, ça serait une chose qui est très capitale. Il y a aussi le renforcement de confiance entre les adolescents et les parents. Quand on suivait ces, cette approche, l'approche parenting, et les enfants suivaient l'approche pro-SEF, en arrivant à la maison, les parents et les adolescents discutaient des différents thèmes qu'ils ont eu pendant les séances. Il y a aussi le témoignage des parents qui commencent à observer un changement positif dans le comportement de leurs enfants après avoir passé les 16 séances du programme CFE. Les, donc, après ces 16 séances, les parents ont vu qu'il y a un changement de comportement qui se remarque déjà, les enfants ne sont plus agressifs, les enfants commencent à avoir un minimum de respect et aussi les enfants exécutent différentes tâches sans tenir compte de, de sexe ou, ou bien de l'âge. Par exemple, auparavant, on savait qu'un qu garçon ne devait pas balayer, faire la vaisselle, mais après ces 16 sessions de CEF, il n'y a plus la différence de... de entre les enfants, donc il n'y a plus de discrimination. Et quand c'est une question d'attribuer les tâches, on attribue une tâche sans tenir compte de sexe. C'est un peu ça par rapport à l'adaptation de la RDC. Merci. OK, thank you so much, Ange. Merci. Uh, thank you, Fabienne and Alexandra. And thanks to Audrey for putting the 
the translation into the chat. I hope everyone was able to, to follow along. Um, so we're going to take a pause after this presentation and ask two, two questions um, to you. We're going to put these questions in group map. Some of you have hopefully used this already in during the week. Um, so you'll find the link to the questions in the chat and you can click on it. And then um, we're going to take a minute or two just to reflect individually and you can put your individual answers in and then we'll discuss them in the group. The questions are first, um, Yes. So what do you like about the learnings from the research and the approach to preventing child recruitment over in the yellow side? And then on the second side, how could this approach be adapted in your context or what would be some of the challenges to adapt this approach? So when you get into group map and sometimes it takes a minute to, to enter into it, you can click on the little plus sign um below the question and then you can answer your responses so we're just going to take a minute to kind of think individually and then we'll go into a quick group discussion and i know there were yeah just i see also a question um on the the subtitles so we are, the rest of the presentations will be in English. Um, yeah, so hopefully it was enough to follow along with the slides as well. Apologies for that. All right, so some of you have found your way to using the group map. So yeah, one, one response, the involvement of parents, adolescents and community was one of the learnings um, that was liked in the, in the approach from IRC. I hope you're all able to go to the group map. And if you're not, you can also write your answers in the chat. Okay, we also have the positive impact the group sessions had. And to combine the training with um, income generating activities and using a multi sectoral approach and the involvement of parents on the behavioral change interventions. All right, great. Okay, so what we're going to do is um, using these same questions, we're going to move into the breakout uh, group discussions. And you can discuss the response you've put into, into group map. And if in your discussion you come up with other things, just keep your group map open and go ahead and add your, your additional thoughts there. So we're now going to move you into your, your groups. So you'll get a little invitation. Um, and you can just go ahead and click on it and you'll be in your groups. Welcome back, everyone. If you don't mind um, putting yourself back on mute now that you're in the main room, that would be fantastic. Just saves me muting all of you myself. Um, and uh, Susan, everyone is back now if you'd like to uh, take back over. Super. Um, would it be possible to just share this the group map? Great. OK. All right. I hope you had some uh, useful discussions. Um, and thanks for, for your participation. So if we look at the group map, there are a few questions um, that we can come back to during the Q&A and I'll note those down and come back to them. Um, there's a question about um, how many fathers were participating um, in versus mothers. Um, are we preventing re-recruitment or recruitment in the first place? And what are the linkages with other special services? Um, in terms of what I see people really liked on the approach, 
um, was the holistic approach and how all the different factors that were identified were then addressed um, in different elements of the programming. There were um, the work with caregivers and the work with um, income generating activities and the involvement, particularly the involvement of parents was mentioned several times with the youth together um, as a nice facet of this approach. For how it could be in, um, adapted for other, um, other contexts, would um, focus a lot on parent involvement, so having more parental involvement um, around child protection and thinking about how it can be adapted for migration, for children on the move, um, and also in different regions. So in our group, we talk about how could it be adapted for um, the South Asian context and how to balance economic with uh, livelihoods with also ensuring that uh, education is provided. So thank you so much for all of those contributions and we'll come back to the questions. For now, we're gonna move to our next presentation, which is from our colleagues at AVSI. So I'd like to introduce you to Catherine Nafula, who is Program Officer on Graduation and Linkages with AVSI um, in Ramwanja Refugee Settlement in Uganda, and also Innocent, Swinye, who is Senior Graduation and Linkages Advisor for AFSI Uganda as well on the Graduating to Resilience project. So welcome to both of you and I'll hand it over to, to you for the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Susan. Thank you for that great introduction. So we are going to be our topic introducing to us our topic how structured household coaching activity contributes to prevention and reduction of harm to children in humanitarian setting. These are insights from the absolute graduating to resilience coaching model. Yes, so AFSI is an international organization that has its uh, projects all over the continent. It has projects in livelihood, we address education, it addresses livelihood, shelter, talks about protection, but today we are going to be introducing to you the graduation, graduating to resilience activity. More than one quarter, which is 26% of the world's 25.4 million refugees, mostly women and, uh, and children, they live in the Sub-Saharan Africa. Uganda is home to over 1.5 million refugees who may experience limited community support, poverty, that reduces access to basic needs and healthy services. So all these factors may have harmful effects the development and growth of the children. That is why today, as I've seen, graduation to resilience activity comes up with a project to address some of these issues. Uh, the project is a seven year project. It is a consortium working together with Chico Up and Impact being funded by the USID Food for Peace, targeting 13,200 households, of which 50 are refugees, and then 50 are from the host community. So the major goal of the graduate to resilience activity is to graduate extremely poor refugee and Ugandan households from uh, conditions of food insecurity and fragile livelihoods to become self-reliant and self-resilient. Today, we have also two purposes that we focus on. That is improved household food level availability and nutrition of household neighbors. Then the second purpose, improved economic status. So today we are going to be zeroing it down to the coaching model. I would like to introduce Innocent to take us through the actual case. Thank you very much. Innocent, back to you. Thank you, Catherine, and thanks all for joining um, this particular uh, presentation on how uh, a, a structured coaching model approach can trickle down to addressing harm on children. Uh, if you take back the background that we are working with 13,000 households, uh, but uh, 22,000 of, uh, of the people who live in these households are children. So it, it means that um, 
the trickle-down effect in terms of ensuring that the well-being and the protection of children are very essential. So the coaching model that we are going to emphasize about, look at um, a coach who is well-trained, well-grilled, uh, 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 with a, a well-developed curriculum, moving to the households to ensure that uh, we address issues of uh, protection and issues of nutrition, issues of uh, livelihoods, and a collective aspect of the well-being of the households. So uh, the Graduating to Resilience co tested two coaching models, and we are still continuing to test these models as we enter the second cohort of the interventions. So the first coaching model looks at an individual coach assigned to 25 households to follow these households on a weekly basis to address particular protection needs, uh, basic needs, and also to develop agency among the women and also the entire households to enforce protection and also enforce the well being of children. So the the, the, the coach follows the households and makes sure, sure that the households has developed plans which are aimed at uh, meeting the needs of the children, meeting the, 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 the basic well-being and ensuring that the basic well-being of the children are taken care of by this particular household. So on a weekly basis, the coach goes to the households, sits down with the households, looking through what we call the graduation map which is uh, entirely about the, the pathways where the household sets their goals in addressing particular needs. If it is related to the children, then it is those particular pathways that the coach needs to develop goals together with the, with the households to see that they achieve those needs within a specific period of time. And then we have the second model, which looks at uh, the group coaching model. The group coaching model is where a coach follows around 75 households who are met particularly in a group setting. So the topics which are delivered still remain the same. If it is on basic health, it is on protection, it is on understanding uh, the nutrition practices that are aimed at improving the well-being of children. So they meet them in groups. The groups tend to share a lot in commons in terms of their norms, the values. They share and help each other overcome certain obstacles that can affect uh, uh, their children's well-being. And also, they get opportunity of being linked to particular services, including child protection services. So in the group setting, that is where the coach comes in to address particular needs that are related to the well-being of, of the children in the households and also the well-being of, of these households. So we are testing this group and individual coaching model, but within a livelihood context, within a livelihood interventions, that's where the households receive consumption support, the households receive uh, uh, core training in other livelihood component. And then also we have elements of savings, we have asset transfer to boost businesses, which later translate into meeting the, uh, the other needs of the, the people in the households. And then the coaching itself, the coaching that builds on other elements like linkages to ensure that uh, households and other participants in the households receive particular services that are required for them to improve on their lives. Yes, Catherine, back to you. Thank you very much, Innocent. Uh, this has already been uh, talked about by Innocent, the group, of, the group coaching model. Just as he said, it's implemented weekly where the 25 households come together and when you see the picture down at the bottom, that is how the group setting looks like. 4,400 4, households received individual coaching messages by weekly. That, the top picture that you see, that is a, 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 an individual coach having a session with a household. Then two, 206 trained social workers that we call coaches are being trained and they ensure that on a weekly basis or by weekly basis, they visit the household and offer the messages. 
the topics that are being covered yes i talked about them we have the livelihood we have topics on prevention topics on protection nutrition breastfeeding then the coaching materials that we use we have a coaching guide game handbook regression map a self-reflection tool that i use in this session next slide please the processes that we use to ensure that our uh, registered participants have monthly nutrition screening of children below five years, provided monitoring and evaluation of the status of the children's health. Then uh, structured coaching activity, it empowers the families with skills and resources to provide a positive child relationship that ensures the safety of a child. Here, a child is able to receive basic needs because of the empowerment that has been done. And at the end of the day, you find that their safety is secure. Provision of knowledge skills on breastfeeding practices we have planning and demonstrations has significantly contributed to the development of children here at least uh, the family the coaches ensure that a family has a balanced diet and we all know as a family has a balanced diet with the go glow and go foods then they are able to develop well and grow healthier mapping of services has also been done to facilitate the process Different uh, services are being mapped where our participants are linked to ensure that they receive the necessary services. Next slide, please. Some of the, these are the outcomes and impacts on the children. 4,400 households received individual coaching messages on the various topics. Household planning, water sanitation, hygiene, protective health, and all this equipped the participants with uh with knowledge to promote the growth of children the top most picture you see that is a coach or a social worker having a session on, group coach, on, on video coaching then formal and informal child protection services have been mapped to facilitate the referral for the critical child protection services then we have 5,638 active households who are rich with coaching on child protection and basic agenda and this mitigated child abuse and domestic violence among children. We found that uh, because of this particular topic, uh, cases on uh, suicide, they really went down because the problem was being addressed right at the grassroots, which is the household. Next slide, please. Just another outcome, coaching on child protection and gender-based violence, it's strengthened the relationship between the spouses and this created a safe environment for the children, for the children. This session involves both the husband and the wife, the husband and the wife. They sit together and listen to you, the coaching messages, which are all around gender-based violence. So by doing that, you find that there is harmony in the family and the child can grow healthy because of the environment that has been available to them. The monthly nutrition screening of children below five years provides monitoring and evaluation of the status of the children's health. This is being followed up by a social worker monthly, and, and, and records are being kept. The tracking is done to ensure that any case that has been identified, either mom or son, is easily referred for immediate attention. Then, coaching and nutrition facilitated vegetable gardens just as you can see the lady uh, at, the, uh, at the bottom you find that she has a vegetable garden using the small space that she has to ensure that at least her family can be able to have a balanced diet this trickles down to the growth and development of a child key messages around action planning and household responsibility which is one of the topics of coaching with this child labor and exploitation next slide please so these are basically some of the outcomes and i'll just uh, run through at the start of the project which was the baseline the percentage of participants who were reporting experiencing gender-based violence for 19.30 but at the end of the cohort we found that 1.80 for the ones who are now reporting on the experiences that they had in gender-based violence and then uh, the percentage of participants who had who accessed gender-based violence at the start of the project was 0.00%. But at the end of the project, we were amazed that 97.0% were the ones now who are accessing 
well, that's not what we fight for those, those uh, services. And then the percentage of identified cases referred from mom, some and out at the start of the project was 0 0.00. But as we ended our first cohort, which, which was running for the for 30 months, we noticed that 64.0% were the cases that were being identified for mom, son, and child. Next slide, please. So these are the beautiful pictures, some of the outcomes that we have seen over time with uh, the project activity. At the top most, we have the children enjoying the balanced diet. We find that uh, in the refugee community in Ramoanja settlement, the children have continu continuously grown. We find that their development is, uh, is just amazing. The way they grow, the way they think, their environment, their health has greatly improved because of the coaching interventions and nutrition. And then the next picture that we see is one of the components of saving where the participants come together, they sit and save as low as $0.5 or $1 to ensure that at the end of the day, they're able to share out and use that money to support their households and be able to pay school fees for their children, provide for basic needs for their children, and also improve in their livelihood. Then we have at the bottom, we have two ladies who are breastfeeding their children because of the interventions that have been made, because of the coaching topics that have been availed to them and the importance of breastfeeding, we find the mothers embracing the topic and this has changed over time. The children are able to grow healthy and some of these cases, the malnutrition cases have tremendously decreased. The topics of gender-based violence in the next picture, you see that uh, it has really supported households to have a good relationship. Parents can now have a decision, joint decision making. They can plan together for their household. They can support their households together. This has been as a result of the coaching intervention. Then we have a picture just showing us how the individual coaching sessions happen. Thank you. Next slide, please. So some of the obstacles and the challenges that uh, we have faced while implementing the activity is that men's involvement has continued to be a challenge due to the cultural dynamics. You find that uh, in the setting that we are working with, especially in the African setting, the men usually, because of the culture dynamics, when it comes to decision making, it is really hard for them to sit down and decide together. When it comes to planning together with the household, it is really hard. So we find that, uh, and also because of their their routine uh, routine work, it is really very complicated to get them seated in one area and avail to them the coaching topic. So that has continued to be a challenge, but we address this challenge as an activity by going back to the drawing board and at least try to ensure that the interests of the main are also captured. We change the coaching curriculum, we change some the ways we do our intervention to ensure that they are also uh, they're also catered for. And this really supported. Then transport costs for participants to attend group coaching increased the dropout. Because uh, since the group coaching is done in a central place, you find that some of our participants always found it hard to move from their areas and come to attend the coaching session. Sometimes because of transport, they don't have money, uh, probably it has rained like really so much and they really can't come to the sitting point. So this was uh, addressed by the coach or the social worker trying to reschedule the session, especially when it rained. And then for the transport cost, the, the social worker ensured that they come up, they follow what we call a day system. That is one of the things that we use to ensure that information moves around in the coaching setting. So the Bades supported the participants, supported their fellow friends within the group coaching setting to ensure that they also receive this information. And then the sitting also was always, was sometimes moved to a central point, which can favor those that are coming from really far to ensure that they are also part of the session. Relocation of participants to other countries affected the persistent follow up. Since we are working with refugees, we find that sometimes they get reinstated, they get back to they get back to their countries. 
Next point, please. Next slide. Uh, these are some of the lessons learned. The comprehensive program has supported households to become resilient and so reliant. We believe uh, as an activity that regular coaching acts as a critical component in the promotion of child development. The fact that we, the, the, the coaches or the social workers interact on a regular basis with these participants and become part of them. At the end of the day, you find that their mindset has changed, their behavior, the behavior aspect is being uh, addressed as well. And then at the end of the day, they become resilient. So let us, uh, I'm going to back to end here, but allow us to run through the short video to just show you how much our participants have been able to graduate, have been able to sail through. It is just amazing to see these people come from nothing to something. Please, Suzanne, allow us to play that video for just two minutes. I'll be very grateful. Thank you very much. Bo, mi njo bati sharote. Tulona viti na kwa mingi mo demi na seze. Tukasema apana umoetu ni kwanza Uganda. Tukafika nyaka bande. Kufika nyaka bande wakatupokea wakatuleta aparo wa muanja. Tukwa kutana na Amerika wakatupokea UF Fies. Njoo wakatusaidia. Waka kumaiza utusaidia. Waka tukutanisha pamana wa coach na wa CBT. Mie ni kanza business ya mkene. Kwanza business ya mkene, profi ya ile business ya mkene, tukauza mongulue mbili. Kupitia usaidizi ya USAID. Leo nimejitumainia kawisa sana kwenye mina fikia. Kufatana kisi nimepatana na wanangu. Leo hata tukipenda tunezi tuma watoto kubodi ingi hakuna shida. Leo hata mtota na gonjwa tunezi mutunzisha hakuna shida. Bila hata kutumainia musaada ingini juma fondisho ili tulipati na tosha. Inatuongoza kubiote kabisa na kwenye leo tumefikia. Hatuna tena oga imetuma tunasabu shida zote zenye tulipata wakati tulifika umu. Okay, thanks so much, Catherine and the Innocent. Um, what we're gonna do now is um, do a quick question and answer with Catherine and Innocent. So if you have a question, please note it in the chat. I have one already noted. And at the same time, we have again, two questions for you on the approach. This time we're not gonna go into groups, but we're just gonna ask you again to reflect individually and put your responses into the group app. So that link will be coming into the chat for the new uh, group map. But again, we won't go into um, the small groups. So you can find the link in the chat and the two questions are, okay. The two questions are, what do you find useful in the coaching approach that was uh, presented by Catherine and Innocent? And what would be the advantages and some challenges and adapting this approach to your context. So again, you can follow the link and put your questions, I'm sorry, your answers into the group map. And if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat or you can put them right into the group map, either one. But I'm going to, while you're thinking about that and entering your responses into group map, I'm gonna present one question that was already um, asked in the chat. So Catherine and Innocent, the question was, could you elaborate more on measuring the mitigation on child abuse, GBV, and other negative coping mechanisms in this approach? And how can prevention be sustained beyond livelihood interventions through the program? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, in terms of measuring the mitigations of, uh, of uh, the, the child-related uh, issues, 
uh, the the approach has a robust um, ME system, and uh, since we are addressing child protection concern in a graduation approach, uh, and a graduation approach has key elements in terms of um, tracking and following up essential indicators that relates to the child's well-being, and um, in our graduation criteria. We provide for uh, following up on the children's well-being, like measuring uh, if the children are going to school, are they attending school, are their basic needs being met, uh, is there any form of abuse or gender-based violence related to children. These are measured and tracked on a quarterly basis. But also uh, in the coaching system, uh, we follow up on every issue that relates to the child's well-being. And this is reported on a weekly basis in terms of how the entire household is performing and in terms of the, the well-being of children in the household. So there is a structured and a robust uh, monitoring system that uh, pulls out all uh, protection-related issues from the household. And then it is sent back to the coach to go and address through the coaching activities that we provide. Uh, and then the second, uh, can I repeat for me the second question? A bit? The yes, second. Uh, the second part of the question was, how can prevention be sustained beyond the livelihood in intervention? Exactly, thank that you. Is supported. Uh, yes, the approach is aimed at uh, building agency and, and developing self-efficacy among families, which translate into self-resilience and reliance. So if the household's capacity is well developed and they become self-reliant and they become resilient, so the protection aspect and the well-being of children is embedded into that element. So we believe that as we transition households who have graduated, they are able to appreciate uh, the needs of the children, they are able to appreciate the well-being of their children, they are able to appreciate that there are services around them that they can link the children to. And in the system of, uh, of protection, you know, family is the center. The child is in the center of, of, of in the family. So once you empower the family, uh, the child is more safeguarded and protected. So by empowering the family system, and uh, making sure that the family becomes the core element to address the needs and address the well-being of the child in the center. So the approach uh, strengthens the family uh, ring of responsibility to ensure that they are able to meet the needs and address any protection concerns that come on the way. Thanks so much, Innocent. I wonder if we can just uh, show the group map on the screen as well and look at a few of the responses that have come in. Um, so looking at, yeah, what is useful? Um, I think what really struck me is this one where there's the, the interaction between um, the coach and the, the family is very much appreciated. Um, and the increase of self-esteem as well. And that really that the coach um, shares really like life, uh, you know, regular interactions in life with the, with the beneficiaries. Um, and I'll just ask one more question that came on the, the other side is um, because you mentioned that the funding uh, is quite a long-term funding. I think it was over seven years. Could this be adapted for a shorter uh, time frame? do you think? And I'll just give you uh, one it, minute to, to respond uh, to that. Yes, uh, we have two cohorts. Uh, you know, it is a graduation approach, okay? Uh, it is modeled in a way that in court one, we appreciate that um, to build resilience, you must take people through a, a significant time of attitude, behavior change. Uh, and if you talk about attitude and behavior change, it is not a one-off uh, activity that can cause that change. So the continuous follow-up, the continuous relationship building takes a period of time. So in our approach, we believe that 30 months was enough to cause that change. 30 months, that is two and a half years. 
but uh, depending on how the approach or the model of the intervention and uh, because the package we provide is comprehensive is comprehensive so any project uh, which feels like ad adapting the model may look at the resource envelopes in terms of uh, how long uh, the program would take would also be dictated by what resource envelopes you have but our recommended period is in terms of uh, the 30 month period that we have tested and uh, in terms of the graduation rate uh, the projection was that in 30 month we would have uh, uh, 75 percent of our households graduate out of uh, extreme poverty and become resilient and aligned and despite of the covid uh, covid situation which affected uh, the entire implementations and uh, end of the program we saw that over 73 percent of our uh, intended beneficiaries graduated out of the program successfully and uh, this tells you like if it doesn't go beyond 30 months but you will have significant change that you can see in these households. Yeah, thanks so much, Innocent. I think that's a great advocacy point as well, that uh, there should be longer term funding to really see to see changes. Thank you so much for that, both Catherine and Innocent, uh, for the wonderful presentation and interesting program. We're going to move to our next presentation from uh, Tishindi Children's Trust. And I'm going to introduce Maureen Karanja, who is the program's lead with Jishindi Children's Trust and is going to share a really great holistic uh, program with us. So over to you, Maureen. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, so if we can have the presentation on, thank you. All right, so yes, I'm Maureen and I'm going to be presenting holistic and targeted family strengthening interventions um, that we do here in, in Tushinde for child abuse prevention. So um, the presentation will be based on the results we've had. Um, so I'll start with the basics, who Tushinde is, what we do, where we do it. I mean, so providing family support to help vulnerable children thrive is like our mantra. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. So Chinde is a charity based in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, we work in two informal settlements in Mathare and Kambiu. In Chinde, we believe that families should stay together and children should stay with their families we are really not pro-institutionalization of children. So we work with our social workers to provide uniquely designed interventions for each family uh, with social protection being a key component of what we do. Um, so our social workers provide child protection services to this family, uh, which helps reduce the risk factors such as violence, exploitation, food insecurity that are quite common in the informal settlements. We currently support a total of uh, over 140 families and 553 children to be precise. Um, so we have different modes of interventions and I'll just quickly take us through, through them. Um, to start us off, we have the daycare, if you could go to the next slide. Um, so just to paint the context um, of how things look in the informal settlements, most of the caregivers and families don't have a nine to five job. And so they, they seek casual work, which is mostly housekeeping, laundry services. And for them to go to work, then they have to have some form of childcare, which they cannot afford because the daycare centers are quite expensive for them. So they resort to leaving children um, around the neighborhood, asking a neighbor to keep an eye on them or worse, still lock them in the house, um, which, which is really risky because the informal settlements have a lot of safety hazards. Um, like just quite recently, yesterday actually, we had a fire breakout, which are usually numerous in the informal settlements due to poor um, electricity connections in the area. So what Tushinde decided to do is provide childcare support for these families so that they're able to go out and work. 
So we partnered with community daycare proprietors in the, in the area to ensure that the children have a place where they could stay, that they have access to meals, toys, they can play and the child and the child is safe and the parent can go to work being at ease that the child is safe and being taken care of. Um, a similar thing to AVSI is that we also do nutrition screening because you can pick up quite quickly children who are malnourished or not doing very well in the daycare. And we've employed um, collecting data in the daycare, so in form of BMI, um, head circumference, the measurement under arms, and we're able to, uh, it's able to flag out cases of concern with the children that need special care, uh, medical attention, and the daycares have really helped with this. Um, so we subsidize the fees in the daycare so that the mothers are able to take the children there. Um, another key component of our family strengthening intervention is education, of course. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please. So Tushinda provides annual tuition fees and learning materials for the children. And we also follow up on the children while at school. So we do this because the, the caregivers are not able to afford school fees or maybe not on a regular. So then it means the child is not able to regularly attend school and there are high cases of absenteeism. And if the child is not going to school, then they start getting involved in other manner of things that are not productive. Um, so we do provide annual uh, school tuition fees for these children and um, also ensure that the child feels safe in school. And we do this through working very closely with the schools to influence a culture of child protection. Um, so how we do this is that we, we partner with these schools and we take them through child protection training. Um, we enable them to formulate child protection policies that they can use for their schools. Um, we also really advocate for alternative display methods um, so that they do not, uh, they are not inclined to use corporal punishment, which has been a culture issue, especially in Kenya. Um, and then we incentivize this process with the schools through annual school grants that we give to the schools. Um, if we can move on to the next slide. So our other mode of intervention is medical care. So the families we work with are really, really, really vulnerable. And especially at the point of enrollment, uh, most of them go through such critical, um, are going through really critical health issues. Um, they are really, I would say, poor health outcomes for most of these families. And um, they do not have access to the national health scheme that we have here in Kenya called the NHIF. Uh, the NHIF comes at a fee, so there's a monthly fee that, fee that has to be paid. So we help these families um, and we provide this fee so that the fa family is covered, the entire family, including the children, are covered in the NHIF scheme. And we do this until the children turn 18. So through the NHIF, they're able to access outpatient care and inpatient care, which can be really complex because it involves surgeries or being admitted in the hospital for a couple of days. If you follow the um, local news here in Kenya, you'll see that uh, vulnerable families are not able to clear outstanding fees in these public hospitals and they are detained in hospitals. Uh, which is altogether another horror story. So NHIF really helps counter that um, and they're able to access these services at this fee. And it's not always so simple. So they have to work with a social worker to ensure that they have the, the appropriate documentation, uh, like the birth certificate, the birth notification for the children, the ID. So it's usually an intricate process, but we get it done so that they can be on NHIF cover. Um, and then uh, the last of our key family strengthening interventions um, that I'd like to highlight today um, is cash transfers and economic empowerment. So we disperse cash transfers, weekly cash transfers to the enrolled families just to ensure that they are able to 
pay rent, they're able to buy food, they're able to top up on anything that the household needs and meet the needs of the children. But cash transfer is really a short term intervention. So um, the longer term intervention is the economic empowerment where we train and support the, the families we work with to improve their businesses if they already have businesses or to start businesses if they don't have businesses. So we train them to be resilient such that um, if like right now we've had really high inflation and economically things are not doing so well for businesses due to the pandemic and the, the families are able to switch around, they are able to adopt to another business, right? So it, it, we really build on that resilience and, and see them thrive in their businesses. And through this, then they are able to provide for their families. So eventually they're able to pay the school tuition fees, they're able to pay the rent, they're able to feed their families. Um, so these are really great interventions, but for the longest time, it has been a challenge um, measuring the margin of change, like where you know you are making an impact, but how do you measure the impact? How do you quantify the change? So um, at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, the tool that we use for uh, family strengthening. Um, so we have the outcome star. Um, so the outcome star, is an evidence-based tool developed by Triangle. It was developed in 2003. Um, in Tushinde, we started using it in 2018. Um, one of the best qualities about the Outcome Star is that it's an empowerment tool and it's really collaborative. Uh, by this, I mean that the user who is um, the, the enrolled caregiver or parent, um, is an active agent of change. So they are not really recipients, but an active agent of change. And they have to collaborate with the social workers um, in using this tool. So how it works is that um, they, the, they are, the social workers are trained and then um, they have to work with the family members. So they place themselves on this tool. It looks like a star. It has 10 key domains that are really critical in family support programs. So uh, you can see some of them. We have home and money, family routine, boundaries and behavior. Education is a big one. Um, social networks, physical health, progress to work. and they place themselves, how are you faring? So we do this at the beginning when they're being enrolled. So that will be the baseline. And it's it's um, it's not always, it's it doesn't apply, like it's not linear. So for example, uh, home and money, they may be doing really poorly, like it may be a one, but they are in good health. So physical health may be a five. So um, it really depends with the family and the complex issues in the family and what they're going through. But um, these 10 domains are what we measure and they're really critical. So um, the outcome star enables us to quantify the impact and change of our family strengthening efforts. Um, and it's based on a journey of change. So we have a bigger picture um, that we call the journey of change and what we envision for these families. If you could go to the next slide, please, where we can show the journey of change. So that's the five stage journey of change. Um, if you can look at the beginning, we have the stack stage. So this is where the, this is at the point of enrollment and we, the most of these families are at risk because remember they are really vulnerable families. So it could be there's a high prevalence of violence in the home. Uh, they could be, they, they have no source of livelihood, no shelter, children are sick, they're not in school, the parent is sick. So we call it the stack stage and it's color coded, so it's red. Um, and then we go to accepting help. So there's some progression there. So this would be the point of enrollment and they, they need to, they need to accept the help. So remember it's collaborative. Um, and then we have where they try, um, then we have finding what works and eventually we have effective parenting. So where we bid goodbye, but it's not a sad goodbye, it's a great goodbye. So just showing the results of what we had, what we had in 2018, uh, the baseline, if you could go to the next slide, please. 
So we say green is good here in Tushinde, um, and you'll shortly see why. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so this shows the data we took in 2018, first data we took in 2018, and the latest star in 2021. So if you look at the first star, which is 2018, remember red is at the point of crisis where they are stuck. And you can see vast segments of red in different domains and specific domains have uh, really great reds, like a lot of red, like that's physical health, education and learning. Um, they have a lot of reds. And then if you look at the latest star, you can see the change. And this is because of the interventions. So for the physical health and well-being, that's why we have the medical care and medical cover for the entire family so that they are able to seek help for the medical conditions that they have. Um, and then education and learning. Remember, most of the children are already not going to school. So when we take them to school, you see the change. That's why now there's a lot of green in the education and learning. And then we have home and money. And this is because of the cash transfers and the businesses. So that is shows a lot of improvement. So um, maybe as we conclude, I'd like to share a short story of one family we've worked with just to bring all our interventions to life. If we could please go to Lynette's story um, on the next slide, please. So I'd like to share a short story um, of one of the families we've worked with, and that's Lynette. So Lynette was enrolled in the family support program following the adverse effects of the post-election violence in 2007. She'd lost her business. She had been separated from her children and suffered post-traumatic stress. The house she lived in was caving in and she was not able to afford meals and lacked any form of social support. So this is the crisis stage. Through Tushinde, Lynette received medical care. She was rehoused and reunited with her children. The children were enrolled in school. Lynette was trained in business and offered psychosocial support throughout her journey. 10 years later, which is the current picture you see now, her children have progressed in school with their eldest daughter now in college. Um, her elder, eldest daughter is Linda, who is now pursuing community development and social work. And what inspired her career choice is the journey through Tushinde. So Lynette is convinced that the family support program saved her children, uh, saved her and particularly from violence, which was really high at the time, sexual abuse, early marriages, because if she had no choice, then her girls would have been married off really early, food insecurity and even death. Her hope was restored and she now works as a Tushinde community health volunteer, helping Tushinde care for families and restore hope, just like we once did with her. And of, of course, keep children safe. So overall, uh, our family strengthening efforts work. Uh, the outcome star has really evidenced this. And we can say we've had most impact in education, social support, physical health, due to the interventions we have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maureen. Uh, that was a great presentation. I just want to first recognize that we are over time. Um, so I would appreciate for those of you who can stay, uh, we'll just extend for 10 minutes. Um, so we can have a few question and answers um, with Maureen and maybe a few questions as well for our IRC colleagues. If you have to go, I understand that, so apologies for that. Um, so again, at the end of the session, we have a quick group map, our last one uh, with two more questions. If you wanna go ahead and click on that and give your responses. And I know Maureen would love to have your, your feedback. So the two questions are, what types of cl collaboration with other sectors would be needed to provide more holistic support to families? And then second, what do you like about this approach or what challenges would you have to implement this approach in your context? Um, and if we can move to a quick Q&A, there are already a few questions in the chat. So Maureen, if I can ask you. One question was about uh, the time frame. So the question is, do you have a target period? How much time do you give yourselves with one family? Um, and how do you determine self-reliance when that is reached? So over to you, Maureen. All right. So um, like I said in the beginning, um, we 
provide unique design interventions for each family so their time frames differ for each family you could have a family stay for an year you could have a family stay for a bit longer than that so it's quite dependent it's case by case for each family um, and then we have a really unique case management system so each family is designated a family social worker and they, it, it's a really close uh, relationship with the social worker. Um, again, each family has um, has provisions to address any issues they have with a counselor who we have um, in Tushinde. And when it's, I think it's very close to what um, our fellows at APSI said. So it's a lot of mindset change, a lot of behavior, a lot of psychosocial support. And that's why it takes different times for each family. And then eventually when we feel like they're in a better place, that's when we roll out the livelihoods component of the program so as to ensure that they are resilient and that it's sustainable. We have families that have graduated from the program and come back and are now mentors for the families who are there. They can be business mentors. Um, others come back as CHBs, just like we saw Lynette in our story. Thanks, Maureen. There's one follow-up question, uh, additional question. You actually already answered another question that was in the chat, so great. The last question is what type of support is provided to the social workers to make sure they're sure that they are taking care of themselves as well? Oh, wow. That's a great question. <laughs> so uh, with our social workers, we have, we call them reflective practice groups. So that's where it's like a support group for the social workers. And it's usually led by the, the Trishinde counselor and by the lead social workers. And like you're saying, because there's just so much that comes up from these families that can be really complex and it's important that it doesn't weigh down on them. So these support groups really, really help. Um, again, we are at a point where we know our capacity. So we are very open to linkages uh, because where a case really weighs down on you, and we don't have the capacity, we don't have the resources, then we bring in our partners. So we have quite a number of partners in different sectors. So again, taking the multi-sectoral approach, and we also really partner with the government. So there are cases that I would say are beyond our limit, or we do not have the capacity to tackle them. And so we will definitely engage our partners at that point. And then in-house, we support our social workers with the support groups and the reflective practice that happens every regularly with them. Thanks so much, Maureen. That's very clear. Um, I'm going, if I can, just move back to a question from our first presentation since we didn't have time to answer those. So this is for Alexandra and Ange and Fabienne. Um, just two quick questions. One was a question that came through on a point of clarification. So was the, is the program preventing recruitment in the first place? Or is it preventing re-recruitment? So the question was, is it that the program is to prevent the recruitment before the children are associated or is it the re-recruitment? I don't know if that was clear, but yeah, you could go ahead and answer that. Okay, thank you very much. The approach was to prévenir le recrutement des enfants dans des forces et groupes armés, mais aussi c'était de soutenir ces enfants qui sont précédemment impliqués dans des forces, au, dans des forces et, et aux groupes armés. Donc les enfants qui sont partis et les enfants qui sont revenus, qui sont maintenant dans la communauté, comment les parents, la communauté, les autres peuvent les soutenir en fait qu'il n'y ait pas un nouveau recrutement. Merci. Thanks, Anjan. We can see, merci, we can see the translation in the chat. Um, so it was to prevent both. And one more question um, was around the participation of fathers. How did it compare to the participation of mothers? Um, and were there any challenges around that? 
Um, Alexander, do you want to answer that or should I? Um, yeah, I, I think actually if you wanted to put the question to Ange or Fabienne, I know they both had experiences with uh, challenges with recruiting men. Yeah. Perfect. Suzanne, this is Audrey. Can you repeat the question and I will translate for Ange. How was the participation of fathers? La question est, quelle, a, quelle était la participation des parents comparée uh, dans, dans, dans vos activités? Est-ce que les parents, est-ce que les pères, pardon, les papas étaient impliqués? dans vos activités? Quelle était l'implication des papas? OK, merci beaucoup pour la question. Comme on a présenté tantôt, on a dit que c'était parmi nos difficultés. Il y avait beaucoup de femmes qui participaient que d'hommes. OK, so it's part of the challenges that were identified in this program. Uh, actually, the mothers were the most uh, involved in the program compared to the fathers. I can just add that um, I know in our pilot in Nigeria, they found that interest increased among men after the first cohort. And so they think that will help with further recruitment um, of, of fathers in future iterations. So it may just take some time as well. Thank you so much for the, the responses. Um, we will, I will see if we can put the presentations onto the resources. Um, okay, so that's, we can do that. And on the presentations, there is the contact information. So you can be in touch as well with the presenters if there are, are further questions or you want to follow up the discussions. Um, just, I want to give a big thanks to all of our presenters, uh, to Ange, to Fabienne, to Alexandra, Maureen, Innocent, Catherine, thank you so much. Audrey, thanks so much for the, the translation, and I appreciate you sticking with us a few minutes longer. So now we have a pause in the schedule. We uh, have a big break, one and a half hours until the, the next sessions, or now it's uh, one hour and 20 minutes. Um, so please go have your lunch or dinner and enjoy and meet back uh, in Philo for the next sessions at what, uh, yes, 1 p.m. CET time um, in an hour and a half or a bit less. So thank you so much. Um, and I hope it was useful. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank Suzanne. You.